Well, good morning. It is great to see you this morning. Glad that you are here with us this morning at Sunlight. Are you glad to be in God's house? Say amen. 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 All right. What I want you to do is I want you to stand up. Look to your right, look to your left, look behind you, look in front of you. Find somebody that you have not yet said hi to this morning. Greet them and welcome them. Welcome to Sunlight today.
We're here to worship him. Amen. In Isaiah chapter 41, we find this verse, these words in verse 10. Fear not, God says, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. We have this reminder in Scripture that God is with us, and that God is for us, and that He is there. All we have to do is cry out to Him. All we have to do is ask. All we have to do is throw ourselves at His feet. And so as the worship team leads us, as we enter into a time of prayer this morning, it's so good, so important for us to reflect on these truths this morning. Uh, I would ask uh, that you continue to be in prayer for Ben Habegger uh, as Ben continues to recover from uh, his motorcycle accident, just God's healing touch over him in these days as he recovers uh, and makes a full and complete recovery. So keep Ben in your prayers as well as the Habegger family uh, during this time. Uh, and then I uh, would also ask that you be in prayer for Pastor Lyle this week. Uh, he is going in for his second knee replacement surgery this uh, Wednesday, so keep him in your prayers. Uh, in fact, we're going to ask him to come down during the prayer time, and we're going we're to come around him and, and, and spend some time praying for him. Uh, so if you'd like to join us for that, you're welcome to do so. And, and for others, maybe you've got a prayer request, a petition, a need that's heavy on your heart this morning. The altars are open. We encourage you. We invite you to come. Father God, we come before you, and God, we're just so grateful to be here in your house worshiping you together this morning. And 
God, we thank you for, uh, God, this uh, pre-celebration as we look ahead to the week of VBS and all that you're going to be doing in the lives of kids and in families across our community. So, God, for every volunteer, for every kiddo that's going to walk through these doors, for every parent, for every grandparent, God, have your way this week in a mighty and powerful way. And, uh, God, we, uh, we continue to lift up Ben Habegger before you for your healing touch over him. God, we thank you for the work that you're doing that we trust you're going to see through. Uh, God, for full and complete recovery for him in the days ahead. And, uh, and God, we lift Pastor Lyle before you this morning. God, we are, we are so grateful for him and for, for Pat and for their family and for, uh, God, their ministry here. Uh, God, there's not, a, there's, not a, there's not an individual, there's not a soul, there's not a life in this, in this space today. Uh, God, that hasn't been touched in a mighty way by their ministry, God, over the, over the years. God, uh, uh, but we lift Pastor Lau before you now. God, just for your healing touch. And God, we trust that you can begin that work even now. God, we uh, God, uh, can only imagine the, the, the pain that he's been dealing with, uh, not just in recent weeks and months, but uh, going back quite a ways. So God, we, we trust that uh, through the work that you're going to be doing this week, uh, God, that you're going to be bringing relief, that you're going to be uh, bringing your strength and your grace, that uh, God, that you would guide the doctors, nurses, surgeons, everyone ministering to him. Uh, but God, we pray, God, that uh, this would be, uh, God, a smooth process, God, that you would just, uh, uh, just evidence that your hand is in it and that you're at work, so God, that you would, God, just bring a calm and a peace and a, and a presence over them, God, uh, like never before, and uh, God, just evidence that, uh, that you're here and that you're working, and, and God, we, we pray for the recovery afterwards, God, just uh, for relief from the pain even then, God, uh, and for uh, God, the, uh, the full mobility there that, uh, God, that, that for so long, God, has, has eluded Pastor Lau. So, God, we thank you for that work that you're going to be doing as well. And, uh, God, for uh, all the good things that are going to come as a result of that. So, uh, God, we, we entrust him. We, we entrust the, the surgery. We entrust the whole situation to you, God, knowing that you're good. And in God, this week, may they, uh, as a family, just sense, uh, God, your presence through all the prayers, God, that we'll continue to be uh, prayed up on their behalf. Uh, God, may we, as a, as a church, just be faithful in uh, lifting them before you and, and loving them well, God, through this week and in these weeks ahead, too. So thank you, Jesus, for them. God, we, we love them and care about them so much. And uh, we pray all these things and all these requests today in your mighty name, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I'm sure you picked up a bulletin when you came in this morning, so I want to go ahead and encourage you to take that out. Go ahead and tear off that back flap. That allows you to mark your attendance here with us this morning. Also allows us to uh, partner, to connect with you in prayer. We've got a whole team of folks that pray over these requests each and every week, so I want to encourage you to take a moment and do that. Uh, plenty of information about events, activities, things coming up in the life of the church in the days ahead. Um, in case you didn't know, VBS is coming this week. So as we have already prayed, and we're going to ask that you only continue to be in prayer for everything that takes place uh, here this next week, that God would get the glory for that and that uh, lives would be changed, young lives would be changed, families would be changed through, uh, through the work that God's going to be doing um, this week. So we're excited. We're excited about that. Um, other things coming up in the, in the coming weeks, just want you to be aware of those things. And, and we're just, we're grateful as a church for your willingness to support uh, us and, and all the ministries that, that take place here. Um, this is the time of the service that we would normally collect the tithes and offerings. We don't pass the plate anymore, but we do have boxes set up in the back next to each one of the exit doors. So we encourage you, whether it's during this next worship uh, song or at the conclusion of the service, to deposit your tithes and offerings in those boxes. Uh, we are very grateful for your generous support so that we can do all the things that we do. Uh, if you're worshiping here with us for the very first time, we are especially glad that you're here. Uh, here at Sunlight Wesleyan Church, we're about loving people to Jesus. Uh, if we haven't yet gotten a chance to connect with you, we want to make sure we do that. So please see Sarah in the foyer uh, when you make your way out this morning. We have a gift for you, and we'd love to get to know you uh, just a little bit better. So thank you for worshiping here with us together this morning. Uh, let's pray now over the tithes and offerings before we go any further today. Lord Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for... God, your, your presence here with us. And 
uh, for the opportunity as we have already worshipped you in song and, and through the reading of your word and as we prepare to hear the message that uh, Pastor Lyle has uh, been, uh, that you have given him to share with us this morning. Uh, God, we pray uh, that you would just continue to open our hearts to receive all that you have for us. And uh, through the act of giving, through the act of uh, the, the tithes and offerings, God, a, a collection, uh, a reminder, a powerful reminder, God, that uh, all that we have is, is yours. It's, it's but a gift that's on loan to us from you, and you've called us, God, you've commanded us to be good stewards of these gifts that you've given us. So God, bless the gift and the giver this morning. Uh, God, uh, empower us as a church to be the light that you've called us to be in this community. Thank you, Jesus, for who you are. We love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. The Supreme Court has spoken. Public school students can receive Bible education 
during school hours. I can't overstate the importance of that phrase in, in there. It's during school hours. Teach the Bible during school hours. During school hours. Bible education during school hours. I know it sounds crazy, but it's real. In 1952, the Supreme Court ruled that public school students can be released from school in the middle of the school day to receive Bible education as long as the program is off school property, privately funded, and they have parental permission. Not only is the concept possible, but it's spreading rapidly and students' lives are being changed. I have seen my own children testify. They've seen their classmates changed. Kids need to be affirmed, they need sports, but more than anything, they need to hear the gospel. I was in one class recently where the teacher asked if anyone knew the names of Jesus' parents, and in a class of 20 public school students, not a single one knew that Joseph and Mary were the names of Jesus' parents, but all of those students are now being taught the Bible. If I hadn't signed him up, I don't even know what our lives would look like. And like our story, it might not just be, you know, 20 minutes in a classroom. It might lead somebody to a church and change a whole household. There are people in our backyard who have never heard the name of Jesus. I don't know about any other organizations that are doing anything like this. We wouldn't be able to discuss these things with them if not for doing it right in the middle of the school day. The law allows us to do it, so why not do it? This is LifeWise Westerville, fifth grade. I think the first time I saw it, I was like, is that a real thing? Like, can you really, can we really do that? And yet, um, this fall, all four of the elementary schools in Wells County are gonna have LifeWise programs happening um, for various grades, which is incredible. And uh, as, uh, as a pastor on staff here, I have the opportunity to um, oversee uh, and lead our um, Sunlight uh, Missions uh, Team Fund. So we uh, collect dollars each and every week that you, uh, that you give above and beyond your normal tithes and offerings, and we're able to give those funds to uh, various orga organizations, missionaries, uh, charitable organizations, locally, nationally, internationally. Um, LifeWise is actually uh, one of the organizations that we're considering uh, hoping to be able to partner with this coming year, uh, but we can't do so without your, without your help and support. Um, the good news is that you don't have to wait for us as a church to uh, start supporting them in that, in that way uh, for you to get involved. Uh, locally, like I said, they are launching in all four um, elementary schools in our county. Um, Ossian, Middle Sc or, um, sorry, Ossian Elementary School um, started their program this last year, and the other three schools, uh, Lancaster, Southern Wells, and Bluffton, are starting uh, in the next month or two. Um, so they're in need of volunteers, they're in need of resources, um, they're in need of, of folks that are, are, that are interested in being teachers and bus drivers. So uh, the need is great, uh, but God is faithful. And uh, so I just want to share that opportunity with all of you. 
Um, I do have the privilege as well of, of serving on uh, Norwell's LifeWise board uh, and just uh, getting to see and hear about some of the neat things that God has been doing this last year uh, through the program at ASEAN and what's going to be taking place uh, in the other schools locally as well. Uh, so God is on the move and he's on the move in our community. I thought what better time as we, as we look ahead to this week of VBS and as kids are getting ready to go back to school in the coming weeks uh, to uh, make us all aware once again that God is um, actively uh, working in the lives of, of kids and families in our community. So please, please be in prayer uh, for all the LifeWise programs. Um, if you have a kid in school, make sure that if, if their, their grade is taking advantage of that, that you sign them up. It is a program that you have to opt into. Make sure that you're telling all the uh, family members, friends, people you know that have kids about this. Um, just trying to get the word out as much as possible. Uh, I know that at each of the um, kickoff events that each of the schools do as far as open houses go and that the coming weeks, LifeWise is going to be present. And they're going to be trying to get as many kids signed up as possible, but it just takes time uh, to get kids involved with it. So uh, again, please be in prayer uh, for uh, this very, very exciting ministry that is, uh, that is local in our, in our county uh, now. So uh, God is good and we're very, we're very grateful for that. And if, uh, if you're interested in uh, supporting uh, the Sunlight Missions financially as far as, uh, you know, what we do as far as giving out dollars to different organizations and, and missionaries. Uh, please see me after the service. Happy to chat with you more about that too. Um, and just a reminder that you can always earmark that on your tithing envelope. Uh, put that in the envelope and put it in the box uh, behind you as well. So thank you. Thank you for your generous and faithful support uh, of the ministries of Sunlight as we seek to be faithful with the dollars that God gives us and be a blessing to organizations around us doing good work. So, thank you. I'm coming and it just takes me a little longer to get there. God is good. And all the time. God is good. Well, I am so glad to be here with you this morning. Uh, as Pastor Lane has already said, and as you have, have prayed over Pat and I, uh, I had so much fun getting my left knee worked on, and I thought I'd do the right one. So uh, I'm going to be gone for a few weeks. And, uh, but I'm looking forward to uh, hearing Pastor Lane next weekend and uh, seeing what God has placed on his heart and the direction he's going in. So uh, I may not be with you physically next week, but I'll be watching you on the camera. So, uh, and uh, looking forward to what God is going to do. So it's going to be a great time. Well, this morning, though, I'm here, and I want to finish up the Jonah series with you this morning. And to do that, I think we just need to review for just a moment. So if you would just uh, allow me to do that. Jonah was a prophet of God. God spoke to Jonah and told him that he desired Jonah to go to Nineveh. Go to Nineveh and preach the word to the Ninevites because there is great wickedness among them. Jonah had several reasons why he did not want to go to Nineveh, so he decided that he would go the opposite way, so he boarded a ship headed for Tarshish instead. Well, not long after the ship had left the dock, there was a huge storm that came up. And while Jonah slept beneath the deck, the crew was praying to their own gods, asking to be saved. It wasn't going very well. The storm continued. The captain finally went below deck to get Jonah and told him to start praying to his god. And not long after that, the crew found out that Jonah was the problem and ultimately threw Jonah overboard. But God was not done with Jonah. So God saved Jonah by having a large fish swallow him. And three days later, Jonah cried out to God and said that he would end up going to Nineveh. So God had the big fish deposit him on the shore. Jonah went to Nineveh, proclaimed God's word to the people just like he was supposed to. And the entire city repented and God forgave them and did not destroy the city as he had planned. So that brings us today to chapter 4 of Jonah. And this last book of Jonah, chapter 4, is, is confusing to some. Because we've looked at Jonah, we've talked about how he was a prophet, how he was a, a man of God who knew God's ways. He understood God's mercy and grace, and that God looks to show his mercy and grace to all people. We've seen how God had to use extreme measures to get him to repent and obey, and it's mind-boggling, isn't it, that we come to this point in chapter 4 
where Jonah is upset. He's angry. He's mad. And I, I don't know a single pastor or evangelist that wouldn't be overjoyed if an entire city of 120,000 people repented when they preached on a Sunday morning. But not Jonah. He's angry. He's angry that God showed mercy. He's angry that God, sh he's angry that God showed grace. And, and then he gets even angrier when the plant dries up and no longer shades him. But, but instead of me just talking about it, let's go ahead and read it. J Jonah chapter 4, starting in verse 1, and this is what we find. But to Jonah, this seemed very wrong, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord, isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. But the Lord replied, is it right for you to be angry? Jonah had gone out and sat down in a place east of the city. And there he made himself a shelter, sat in its shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. Then the Lord God provided a leafy plant and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the plant. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the plant so that it withered. And when the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind, and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and said, It would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry about the plant? It is, he said. And I'm so angry, I wish I were dead. But the Lord said, You have been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. And should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and also many animals? I want us to notice that the writer of Jonah makes it clear to us that everything that happens in our text happens because he was appointed by the Lord. We've seen that through this book, God appointed the storm. God appointed the fish. God appointed the plant. God appointed his word. God appointed the scorching heat and wind. You would think that he might be trying to tell us something, that God is sovereign, that God is in control, and that it's better to work with the one who is sovereign and in control than to try to go against him. That's one of the lessons he's trying to teach Jonah. Jonah has been the appointed agent of God to bring mercy and grace to the people of Nineveh. And then God shows Jonah mercy and grace, again, because Jonah didn't deserve a plant for shade or anything. But then when God removes the plant, Jonah's angry. In fact, in our text, it tells us that he was angry enough to die. And the Lord said to him, you pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow which came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should I not pity Nineveh, the great city in which more than 120,000 people accepted me? So what's the point here? What's the lesson that we need to learn? Well, I think it comes here in God's response to Jonah. God is pointing out to Jonah that instead of being bitter and angry, he should instead rejoice over the non-destruction of the city of Nineveh. The plant that God created to shade Jonah was a gift. It was God doing something for someone who was undeserving. And we seem to forget that God provides gifts for us each and every day. What about the time that the money and the bills were just not coming out right? And then you happened to get an envelope with a gift inside that was just the right amount that you needed. Or what about the time that your car had a flat tire and, and at just the right time somebody came along to change the tire for you? What about the time your furnace stopped working and you were sure that the repairman was going to, to say you needed a new furnace and you didn't have the money for a new furnace? And it turns out it was just a $10 part. 
We forget about those times in our life, don't we? We forget about those times in our life of those blessings or God's gifts. And I'm not talking about the fruit of the Spirit or the gifts of God, but I'm talking about those little things that take place in our life that somehow we think we deserve, but we don't. And, to, and so this plant here in the story can represent any sort of grace or gift from God. And let's be honest, how often do we forget that all of God's gifts are given to us even though we are totally undeserving of them? So God causes this plant to spring up and give shade to Jonah. And our text tells us that Jonah was glad. He was happy. I mean, he was a happy dude. He was out there in the desert, the sun was shining, but he was under this plan, it was giving him the shade. He was just doing great and thanking God. But there's a contrast here. He was unhappy with God's grace towards the Ninevites, but he was happy about God's grace towards him. Keep in mind that, that we're, what we're talking about here, what, what about that person that you know that seems to have it all. I mean, they have a big house, they have nice vehicles, they have money. They, they never seem to have any problems. Do you look at them sort of like Jonah looks at the people of Nineveh and this plant? They, they don't deserve that. I deserve that, but, but they don't. The Bible tells us not to be envious of them or to be angry with God because he has blessed them. Instead, we should look at it as an opportunity to praise God for his grace. And even if we receive his grace with gratitude, what happens when God sovereignly removes his blessing from us? In other words, when things are going good and we're praising God for his blessings, but then all of a sudden some unexpected bills come due to whatever sickness strikes, strikes us or someone in our family or something else is going through some sort of tragedy, what happens then? You see, Jonah's problem is oftentimes our problem. Somewhere along the way, Jonah got to thinking that he had somehow merited God's favor and God's blessing and God's calling and God's grace, and he had forgotten somewhere along the way that God's grace is undeserved and totally dependent upon God. And like this plant that shaded Jonah, the grace of God comes to us without any labor on our part. It comes to us without our laboring to earn it, produce it, or make it grow. It happens without our intervention, our, our ingenuity, but we tend to claim it as our right. And we complain when it no longer is ours. We as Christians have to remember that that we're still in the land of exile. We're still engaged in spiritual warfare. We're still required to carry our crosses and repent and take our share of suffering for God's sake. And so when these things happen, we have to be more like Job than Jonah. You might remember Job, all those bad things that happened to him and all the things that he lost. Well, in Job 2.10, he says, he replied, you're talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? In all this Job did not sin in what he said. And if we go back to Jonah 4.10, we find God speaking to Jonah regarding this plant where he says, But the Lord says you have been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. To paraphrase this verse, it might read like this. Jonah, I caused a fish to swallow you, and then I caused that fish to puke you out on dry land. I sent you to Nineveh, and 120,000 people got saved. And the only thing you care about is this stupid plant. Jonah causes us to look at things from God's eternal perspective. We need to be reminded of this constantly. God provides us with things, and we get so enamored by the things that he has provided that we start caring more about things than about the eternal souls of people. We start caring more about the things he provides than the one who provided those things. We can be a little like Jonah. We can care more about our little shaded spot than we care about the community around us. 
And Jonah got upset because the thing that gave him comfort and made him happy was something that God gave him and, and not God himself. Jonah had found his happiness and comfort in the thing rather than in the one who provided it. So God takes it away to show Jonah where his affections lie. And the results of all of it is that Jonah gets angry. I'd like to offer you this thought. I think Jonah is angry because he's finally seeing himself for the first time. God has shown them what he really is. God has shown Jonah that Jonah is selfish. He's self-centered. He's arrogant. And that he still thinks of himself and his desires more than following God's plan and God's desires. And through the removal of the plant, God reveals to Jonah that Jonah cares more about a plant than 120,000 people. Now, last week I mentioned in the message that the, it was estimated that there were between 600,000 and a million people. And that number, 120,000 in Scripture today, is a lot smaller than what I mentioned last week. So why the discrepancy? Well, you'll notice in Scripture that it mentions that those 120,000 people don't know their right hand from their left. And that is because this scripture references little children. So if you take 120,000 little children and then multiply that by everything else, you're closer to that one million estimate of people in that city. So while scripture says it was 120,000, that was 120,000 small children, a million people. And I dare say you would not find a minister in the world today. I don't believe Pastor Lane who would say if a, hundred, or if a million people came to the Lord today because of a preaching that they would be upset. I don't think you're going to find anybody that way. But Jonah was. Jonah was mad. One million people repented and were saved. And Jonah's mad because God forgave them. And Jonah's plant died. And now he has to sit in the sun seems like an odd way to end this book with Jonah pouting after a monumental event in Scripture. I mean, how, how do we apply this book to our individual lives? Well, allow me to offer a couple of thoughts. Oftentimes, God wants us to do the work with him so that we can see ourselves in the work. Could God have done all that took place in Nineveh without Jonah? You bet he could have. And it probably would have been done a lot sooner. So why doesn't God do that? Why does he desire to use us? I think that we tend to think that we are so wonderful and glorious and that God is so impressed with us and our skills when in reality, if we were honest, we probably don't love the way we should. And we're not as marvelous as we think we are. We don't care the way we should. We don't understand grace the way we should, we, but, but we don't see it until we step out and begin the mission. And that's what happens. God sends us out of this building on a mission to bring a message to our communities and our neighbors so that we can see conversions in our communities, but in the process, we begin to see conversions in ourselves. God used Jonah not because he couldn't find a better prophet, he used Jonah because as God converts the sailors on the ship and as God converts the people in Nineveh, he's working on Jonah as well. And it concludes with God asking, taking Jonah on a journey through his self-righteousness and through his rebellion and through his anger and through his prejudice, all for the purpose of making Jonah the man who God had meant him to actually be. Maybe you might be asking yourself, did Jonah ever repent? Did Jonah ever get right with God? Well, we don't know that for sure. We really don't have the answer to that except to say that someone wrote the book of Jonah. Throughout this book, we see time and time again how God was trying to speak to Jonah, wanting Jonah to listen. Sometimes he did and sometimes he ran. And as I read this book, it reminds me that God is speaking to us all of the time. But many times in order to hear God, we need to push ourselves out of the way and focus entirely upon God. 
So as we close the series this morning, I'm, I'm simply going to ask you a, a couple of questions. What has God spoken to you about lately? And if your answer is, I, I don't know if God has spoken to me about anything lately, then my response would be, <laughs> maybe you haven't been quiet enough to hear him. What has God called you to do that you've tried to push away because you don't want to? Who has God called you to go to? The purpose of the book of Jonah is to show God's glory, and how are we showing that? Because you see this book of Jonah, as I said when I started this, as I was reading it during our, our uh, year of reading the Bible, as I, as I went back over this book, there is so much inside this book. There is so much inside chapter 4 that we could spend months simply going over chapter 4, looking at the different ways it, re it talks to people and what we should learn from it. But Jonah's problem was... Jonah never really wanted to get quiet enough to hear from God what God really wanted. This morning, we're going to close our service with communion. And some of the most profound and intimate times that I've ever had with God is as I was preparing for our receiving or taking communion. Because in that time, you are to, to look at yourself. You to are to examine yourself and see within yourself if there is something standing between you and God, if there is something that is causing God not to be able to speak to us or for us, more importantly, to hear from him. And so in a few moments, I'm going to ask some, some Pastor Lane and, and John and John to join me, and we're going to to prepare the elements and, and during that time I'm going to ask you maybe for the first time all week I'm going to ask you to clear your mind and think of nothing else except God and say God what are you trying to teach me is there something that I need to give over to you God before I take communion and I guarantee you, if you quiet yourself and you ask God that question, God will respond. So in these few moments as we prepare communion, that's what I'm going to ask you to do. God, speak to me. God, whatever you have for me, I want you to tell me. And then as we take communion, it gives us an opportunity to share that meal with God. To be able to, to be with him and to take the bread and to take the juice and to be a part of that. That special relationship that comes only during this time. So I want you to close your eyes and I want you to bow your heads. And I'm just going to pray real quickly. And then I'm going to leave the platform and we'll get ready for communion. But I want you to continue to just ask God what it may be that he has for you today. Lord, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for this series of messages that you have provided for us from Jonah. And I pray, Lord, that there have been some valuable lessons that have been learned from it. I pray, Lord, that as we prepare ourselves for communion this morning, that we will take an opportunity to completely quiet ourselves to have you inspect us and if there's anything Lord that we need to give over to you that we will do that but then we will continue Lord to listen for you to speak to us and Lord I pray that you speak to everyone here in this sanctuary this morning those who may be listening from home this morning I pray Lord that you would speak to them just as well Lord as we have seen through this book you had to speak to Jonah in many different ways and many different things. And Lord, you had to teach him some lessons. And Lord, you have those same things for us today as well. So Lord, speak to us, we pray. In your name, amen.
once again at Sunlight, we serve an open communion, which means that you don't have to be a member of Sunlight to take it. The only thing we ask is that you have that personal relationship with God as you take communion this morning. We are going to stand here. Pastor Lane and I are going to be here with the juice, and John is going to be at that end with bread, and John's going to be at that end with bread. Just make your way down the center aisle, and then go back this way and have a seat in your pew, and then we'll take a communion all together at the same time. If you have a gluten allergy, if you would go to John on that end, he'll have uh, a gluten-free uh, option for you as well. If you are ready, we will take we will offer communion.
communion and for us to bring it to you, just raise your hand and we will bring it back to you. As Jesus met with his disciples in the upper room that evening, they had a very intimate time, I'm sure, and all the disciples were listening to every word that Jesus said. As he picked up the bread, he broke it. And he said, this bread represents my body, body that is broken for you. Take it and eat in remembrance of me. he took the cup he raised it towards heaven and blessed it he said this cup represents my blood a blood that will be shed for you blood that will be shed to cover the sins of you and all of the world he said take it and drink in remembrance of me pray now in closing. Jesus, as we have had the great privilege this morning of partaking of the elements, these simple and yet very powerful reminders that, that you came to save us and you, you paid the ultimate sacrifice for that salvation that you pour out so freely on us if we would only turn and hand over control of our lives to you confessing and, and repenting of our sins and, and, and believing in you and putting our faith in you. So thank you, Jesus, for that saving work and for that work that you continue to do in the world around us. So uh, may this not stay here with us today when we leave this place, but uh, as we go out this week ahead, uh, may we remember the immensity of the sacrifice that you made for us and in turn, uh, handing total control of our lives over to you, our, our actions, our decisions, our words, our thoughts. Jesus, have your way in us and through us this week ahead. We pray all these things in your mighty name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. You are dismissed. Have a great week. God bless.